Uh, all right, this is automated bug finding in practice with Ken Gi Ken Clint Gibbler and Daniel DeFries. Uh, Dr. Clint Gibbler is a senior security consultant and research director at NCC Group, a global information assurance specialist providing organizations with security consulting services. By day, he performs penetration tests of web applications, mobile apps, and networks for companies ranging from large enterprises to new startups. Daniel is co-founder of Practical Program Analysis, LLC, a boutique security firm specializing in building security tools that make pen testers and security engineers more efficient. He is currently a PhD student at UC Davis, where his research focuses on developing analysis techniques to find bugs in the Linux kernel. Please welcome Quentin Daniel to ChillCon 2018. Hi. Thank you so much for coming, and thank you to the organizers for having us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about a number of different automated bug finding techniques, and we're also going to talk about uh, when they're good, when they struggle, and point you to a bunch of resources for learning more, whether it's tools, papers, uh, or other conference talks. So let's get into it. First, a little bit about us. So I'm Daniel DeFries, so I'm a PhD student at UC Davis. My research uh, is program analysis on systems code, particularly Linux kernel. I like finding bugs on Linux. Uh, we run a new uh, security firm for Practical Program SLC, LLC, uh, finding uh, bugs, and basically we want to do program analysis from a practical perspective. And I would be happy to talk your ear off about LLVM. Uh, and I'm a research director and security consultant doing penetration tests uh, at all sorts of companies, uh, also a co-founder, and I'm a Midwesterner living in San Francisco, the land of kombucha on tap and goat yoga. Uh, so before we get into it, let's talk a little motivation about this talk. So life as an application security engineer tends to be like the following. So you have a small team uh, of AppSec professionals who are supporting hundreds or even thousands of developers. So there's too much code being developed too quickly uh, to possibly review by hand. But at the same time, you want to ensure uh, a security baseline across all of these repos and services. So the question is, how can we find bugs at scale? And can we find some bugs semi-automatically? So the answer is yes, we can, uh, or this would be a pretty boring talk. It would just be one slide that said no. Uh, but unlike uh, a lot of people who hype up specific techniques or specific products, uh, we're going to keep it real and be honest about strengths and weaknesses of various approaches. OK, so this is uh, the entire talk at a big picture. So we're going to talk uh, at a high level about some automated bug finding in general and sort of the big classes of it. Then we're going to talk about some specific techniques in detail. And then at the end, we're going to have a sort of cheat sheet overview for everything we talked about. Here's when it's good. Uh, here's when it has troubles and, and things like that. OK, so when we say program analysis, uh, this sounds sort of fancy. But really, it's just a pretentious way of saying programs that analyze other programs. So Specifically, we're going to be talking in the context of security, but really this could be applied to a number of problem domains, uh, such as uh, just analyzing program behavior or just generally understanding how a, a given system works by building a tool uh, to analyze it. So you can group uh, automated bug finding techniques into two high-level categories, static analysis and dynamic analysis. So static is reasoning about code based on looking at it, and then dynamic is running code and observing how it behaves. So one, you look at the code. The other, uh, you are running it and uh, observing how it behaves at runtime. So static analysis is nice in that it's high coverage because you see all of the code, uh, and it can be fast. But the con is that it's imprecise in that uh, just inherently in any static analysis tool, there's various uh, approximations and assumptions you have to make in order to um, just build a tool that actually uh, finishes running uh, in practice. Uh, on the other hand, dynamic analysis is precise in that if you see uh, a vulnerability that's actually exploited, you know it actually is uh, a bug. So it tends to report more true positives. But on the other hand, code coverage can be uh, a challenge. So when you're only detecting vulnerabilities based on uh, running it and observing behavior, any code that you're not running, you can't find bugs in. Right? And, and again, uh, this is just a high-level generalization. So some common terminology when we're talking about uh, automated bug finding tools. Um, so we care about whether a tool reports or doesn't report something. And uh, then on the other side, whether something's a real bug or not a real bug. So if a tool says, hey, this is a bug, and you look at it and it actually is, so we call this a true positive, which is great. We found uh, a bug we care about. But if the tool says, hey, this is a bug, but it's not a real bug, we call this a false positive in that it thinks something's an issue, but it's not. 
Uh, and then on the other side, if a tool doesn't uh, find a bug, but through pen testing or other approaches, you find it's actually there, uh, this is a false negative. Uh, so this can be bad because you may think that, hey, we've used all these tools and we're pretty sure that uh, this tool or this code base is secure, but uh, you've missed some things. Um, uh, but then a good thing, true negative, if it doesn't report a bug and it's there's no bug there, cool, like don't bother me about things that don't exist. So uh, ideally you want to minimize false positives and also false negatives, but this is the real world and you can never build a tool that is perfect in both. Uh, there's just fundamental reasons why this is never the case. Okay, so first topic, let's talk about static taint analysis. So this sounds uh, complicated and fancy, but you've probably used a form of this already, right? So as a penetration tester, oftentimes we're looking in code bases for things that might be interesting to investigate further. Uh, and one Python example is the run method of subprocess, which uh, takes an argument and runs it uh, as sort of a shell command. Uh, so if an attacker is able to pass uh, input into this, this could be dangerous because it could lead to code execution. So grep is nice in that it's very uh, uh, simple to search for a given string or regular expression, but it doesn't quite do everything we want, right? So if we just look for the string, we may match on something that's in a comment. We may match on something that's in a string. So, you know, subprocess.run in both of these cases it is textually in the code, but it's not actually running the method that we care about. So in order to have some language-aware uh, processing, uh, we really need something that can parse the source code into uh, a format that we can reason about. Um, so often we take source code and parse it into an intermediate format or uh, abstract syntax tree uh, or AST, um, which allows us to do things like the following. So really here we're looking for find me every time the run method is called on the subprocess module. So rather than looking at just the string text uh, of the source code, we can parse it into this tree-like structure where we might say, okay, uh, this isn't just text, it's actually a conditional. And we see uh, there's this call expression representing uh, the subprocess.run method and so forth. So rather than operating on just text, we're operating on uh, a tree or a graph-like structure, which lets us reason about code constructs. Uh, and so ultimately, we need to know what we're looking for, as one uh, wise woman said. Uh, you get in life what you have the courage to ask for. And uh, yes, we just put a quote from Oprah in our uh, computer security talk. Uh, so specifically, what do we want, right? So when we're pen testing, we want things like, here's some data I control, and it gets passed to, in this case, the arguments of subprocess.run. Uh, so OWASP calls these injection attacks. Uh, where there's basically attacker-controlled data that go to some dangerous location. Um, and when you think about it, this actually describes a ton of different types of vulnerabilities. So buffer overflows, cross-site scripting, SQL injection, uh, and so forth. So if you've heard of uh, various commercial static analysis tools like uh, Checkmarks, Fortify, uh, and a bunch of other ones, this is essentially at their core how they actually work. So uh, at the beginning you have source code, which is then parsed into uh, an intermediate representation such as an abstract syntax tree. Uh, but from there we don't have quite all the information we want. We want to add uh, control and data flow on there as well. So, um, you know, uh, this statement uh, if it evaluates to true, then we uh, execute these or not for conditionals or, you know, this is how data flows through the system. Um, so by adding these extra edges uh, and building a graph, we can reason about control and data dependencies between statements and functions. So once you have all of this knowledge codified up, you can then apply various security rules and then, at the, uh, and then out of this you get uh, some security bugs. So in every uh, static analysis tool, there's several core components. Um, so let's talk about those. So Flask is a Python-based uh, web application framework. So let's look at a very simple controller that uh, takes in a folder URL parameter and then uh, runs ls on that folder. Um, so what's dangerous here is if a malicious uh, folder value is passed in, then uh, potentially there's a command injection issue here. So in general, we want to keep track of something called sources, which is where does attacker-controlled input enter the system. So examples are uh, URL and form parameters, headers, environment variables, um, and so forth. And then we care about where does this dangerous input potentially go. So we call these sinks, which is basically if an attacker can control input that goes here, this is bad. 
So some examples of syncs. So in this case, it's uh, any uh, arguments to subprocess.run. But some other examples are just any unparameterized SQL query. Uh, if you're generating HTML without properly encoding it, this can lead to cross-site scripting, um, and so forth. OK, but in the real world, it's not often that you uh, get attacker-controlled input and directly pass it somewhere dangerous. Usually, there's a series of steps in between where it's processed or maybe passed between functions or things like that. So we need to be able to track uh, when did it enter the system and then how eventually does it get there. Um, so the intermediate steps in that uh, are called transfer functions, which is basically an operation where attacker controlled input or taint is propagated. Uh, so some examples of this are um, assignment or various string concatenation uh, operations and things like that. OK, the final thing is sometimes uh, either we use a library or build a function ourselves that uh, processes user input and then makes it safe. So for example, here, we could have this canonicalized path method that makes sure that uh, the user provided value isn't in a folder other than one of the ones we expect. So in general, we're looking for where, um, where does attacker-controlled input start? Where is it bad if it goes to? How does it get between those two? And then does any of those steps pass through a method that makes it safe? So if the tool doesn't understand various uh, sanitizer methods, it may report an issue that we don't actually care about because uh, we've made it safe. The tool just doesn't get that. Uh, so some examples of this are performing output encoding to uh, protect from cross-site scripting, uh, parameterized queries to prevent from SQL injection, uh, and so forth. OK, so when is static analysis hard? Uh, this could be uh, 10 hours of content itself, but here's some high-level things. Uh, so when you're reasoning about code, if you don't have all of it, uh, then you can't properly model it, right? So if the code uh, passes uh, some tainted data into some library function and we don't have that source code, we can't reason about it. So we don't know uh, when we get it back, like where does it come back into the system? Was it made safe in this library? Uh, if you're reaching out to an external API, you don't necessarily know um, what it's doing with the data, and so forth. There's also dynamic language features that are hard to reason about statically because, again, we're not running the code. We're, we're just reasoning about it. So uh, eval-type functions that take uh, a string and uh, run them as code, or, for example, using reflection in Java. Uh, it's also tough to do interprocedural analysis. So, so far, the examples have been within one method, but in many cases, uh, Tainted data is flowing across classes, across files, across methods, and we need to be able to keep track of this. And just implementation-wise, this is hard. Uh, also, supporting many languages and frameworks in practice can be a ton of engineering work. Um, for example, just on C, depending on which compiler they're using, the language constructs they ex uh, accept may be very different. And your tool needs to be able to handle all of them. Uh, so there's a very interesting article below from uh, Coverity where they basically talk about, hey, we built this tool, and here's a bunch of problems we had actually getting it to work uh, in practice. OK, so what are some nice things about static analysis? So tools scale better than people. You don't have time to manually review millions of lines of code, but you can throw a tool at it. Uh, it can also give you some interesting results for large legacy code bases, finding some uh, low-hanging fruit. And human auditors get tired. Um, you know, after so many hours. But tools, uh, because they define what they're looking for, uh, they can always apply the security rules consistently. Uh, and in theory, you can keep up with the rapid pace of development, but uh, doing very complicated data flow uh, can be slow in practice. Uh, so if you're using this as an application security team, uh, there's often a significant initial time investment in setting it up and tuning it. Um, so just out of the box, it may report tons and tons of false positives. So you need to uh, teach it how your code base works. And it can also be a large uh, recurring time investment uh, triaging the finding, which can be boring for the EPSEC team. And uh, pushing those results to directly to developers can damage trust. Uh, so here's a bunch of tools. Uh, Break them in is the most popular Ruby on Rails one, uh, and we've listed uh, a bunch of resources for other languages. Uh, and there is an awesome static analysis GitHub repo that lists uh, like hundreds of them.
so if you want to know more about the uh, principles of how static analysis works, there's a pretty great book uh, written by several of the uh, original Fortify people called Secure Programming with Static Analysis. Uh, if you want to understand the academic underpinnings a little bit more, there's some compiler books that are pretty good. And if you want to know uh, a huge amount of mathy detail about all these different program analysis things, you can read uh, Principles of Program Analysis, which is uh, incredibly dense. I think like the third page is pretty much all equations. Uh, but there's some good stuff there too. Yeah, so, so that's static analysis. But static analysis isn't the only way that you could find these bugs, right? Uh, so let's talk about the same problem, but approach it from a dynamic perspective. So we're still talking about taint analysis. So we're still looking for uh, data flows that come from some defined source where we think an attacker control input. And we're still looking for data flows to some sensitive sync where we don't want attackers to be able to provide input. And we want to figure out if it's possible to get there. And if so, how do we get there? What's the path? But we're going to try and do it dynamically. So the way you do this with dynamic taint analysis, also known as taint tracking, is that you uh, instrument the program. So you're going to take the data structures that exist and you're going to add some fields to them. So if you see uh, the diagram at the bottom, so this might be what it would look like approximately if you were going to do uh, taint analysis dynamically for Java strings. So this would be a popular target. So Java strings are going to be objects that have the actual string data. They have some length among much other things in metadata. Uh, and they exist in memory. Now, instead of just having a vanilla Java string, what we would do is we attach an another field, we'll call this a taint tag, and set the taint flag to true if the uh, string came in from, say, uh, an HTTP request, and set it to false if it's a string literal, if it was generated from something we trust. And then we'll propagate this. Now, the propagation will be similar to static taint analysis, and we'll track it as it goes through the program. This happens at some low level, usually. So static taint analysis, you're doing source code level analysis, and you're going to try and reason about properties of the program. This is totally different. We're going to instrument it possibly at the Java byte code level. We could instrument it at the machine code level, like x86. We could instrument it uh, at uh, so Python interpreter or something like that. And so you need to actually modify the runtime. And then you need to exercise the program, right? So this is dynamic analysis. We can't reason about all paths automatically, so we need some sort of test suite or a fuzzer, or you can just manually click through the program, and somehow you actually have to drive the program and run it. And then you'll run the instrumented version, and you'll see, do we actually see any tainted data go to syncs? That's our goal. If a tainted data does actually re reach a sync, then uh, we have a problem. The nice thing is it's dynamic analysis is that if it, you actually see it happen, you don't have to worry about false positives because you have a trace. This actually happened. So in the taint analysis world, the, instead of transfer functions, they tend to call it taint propagation. It's very similar. You define a taint policy. So you list your sources and sinks just like you did before. Then you decide, and this is a decision, how is taint going to propagate? So here if I have an assignment from x uh, 2x from y plus z, let's say either y or z is tainted, I have a decision to make. Is x now tainted? Does the uh, plus operator, uh, if it's concatenation, if it's strings or whatever, does that uh, propagate taint or not? If it's straight assignment, you probably would. Do string builders propagate taint? Does uh, you know, various operations. So you have to define a policy for all of the language constructs, usually at a low level, again, so Java bytecode, uh, what, what is going to propagate taint. You also have to worry about uh, implicit flows, so control-dependent flows. If I have, if A is true, then B is true, now clearly there is a flow of information from A to B here, right? A and B will always be set to the same, yet there's no actual machine code assignment anywhere in there that's going to say, B is equal to A. So this would be an implicit flow. Do I worry about this? In uh, the privacy world, if you're worried about tracking taint of information leaks, for example, is a phone maybe leaking uh, your unique identifier or uh, your user ID or something, this might be something that you'd be very interested in tracking. But if you taint uh, implicit flows, all of a sudden you're going to taint a lot of things, and now you have to deal with false positives. So again, there's lots of decisions to make here. You can't just run a taint analysis. It has to be tailored to your specific problem. And these decisions are made with respect to trade-offs, right? So what you want to avoid is over-taint. 
consider uh, the example of having a function table. So I've got some function table that uh, has a list of functions in it, and perhaps I'm going to receive input in from a network source. So this is going to be a network packet with lots of headers. This might be partially tainted, right? So perhaps there's protocol headers that I don't consider tainted, but I would consider the payload data tainted. And now I'm going to jump into a function table based upon this network data. Do I consider that function jump tainted? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on what, uh, what part of the network packet I'm reading. And if you decide to taint control flow like this, now all of a sudden you're going to taint a lot of things. And this will probably lead to overtaint, and you'll lead lots of false positives. So you have to be very careful about what you're considering tainted input and not. It can't just be anything that comes into the system, usually. Further considerations are... Because this is a dynamic analysis, dynamic data analysis, clearly you have to be, have, be able to build the source and instrument it. And this can be an onerous requirement because uh, you have to be able to instrument every runtime. Uh, so if you're targeting Ruby, then you need to build instrument Ruby. If you're targeting Android, you need to build instrument the Android Java interpreter. Again, leading to implicit flows is a decision. It will... Uh, probably lead to overtaint if you handle implicit flows. So typically, uh, taint analysis will ignore it, and they just say, well, we don't handle that. And inherently, taint analysis will lead to performance degradation. So one enticing thing might be, let's just run a taint analysis in production. So we'll just instrument our application and then deploy it. And if we see any input that's come in that is tainted that hits a sink, we should throw an alarm. And we'll just see what happens in real life, which would be really amazing, except for it will probably make your application much, much slower. Because all of your objects and memory will be larger, your runtime performance will go down. And in practice, this is very difficult to do. So what people tend to do is they instrument it in test, and they run test suites on it, and hope that these test suites are representative of what you see in real life. And we all know there are some limitations there. You have to decide at what level are you tainting. Are you interested in tainting every bit? If you're tainting every bit, then you have metadata for every bit of memory. This is probably going to be difficult to do. So you probably can't taint every bit. You probably taint at a much larger level, but now you have a trade-off. And then finally, what do you do about native interfaces? So tip, let's say you're tainting an Android app, uh, and then an Android app calls into native code, and then that, that response comes back in. Well, you probably can't taint the native code too, uh, Maybe you could, but typically you're probably just doing the interpreter. And so now do you taint everything that comes in from native code? You probably have an overtaint situation. Do you taint nothing that goes into native code? You probably have undertaint situation. So it, there are, again, lots of decisions, and you have to think about what exactly am I trying to do here. There's lots of resources on this. There's a fantastic paper, um, very classic, all you ever wanted to know about dynamic taint analysis and forward symbolic execution. If you're interested in that, I would recommend starting there. Uh, taint Droid for Android stuff is a, both a uh, paper and a tool. Uh, it's what sort of got me into this. Uh, there's another paper here, linked to a couple of tools. These are ta dynamic taint analysis for binaries, mostly. Um, but there's taint analysis for, for lots of things, Valgrind. Uh, you can find it. So. That's taint analysis, both st static and dynamic. Let's switch gears a little bit uh, and talk about a different technique that tries to do something completely different. It's called symbolic execution. And the goal here is to think about what are the limitations of particularly of dynamic analysis in general, which is that when you watch a program run and you provide it a, some concrete input, you get to see one path through that program. You have one piece of information, which is that this input drives the program down some particular path. Even if you're using a fuzzer, we'll talk about fuzzing in a little bit, you then throw a lot of inputs at it, and you see that each one of these inputs provides some particular path through the program. But when a human reads code, they don't really read code that way. They'll look at the conditionals, they'll reason about it and say, well, uh, perhaps this whole range of values, if I see if x is less than 100, a human doesn't say, well, oh, for some value 74 will go down this path. They say, well, any time x is less than 100, it'll take this path. So how can we sort of take a step towards automated reasoning about software? And symbolic execution tries to do this by marking variables as symbolic. So the step one, usually, when you're using a symbolic execution engine, is you pick variables that you're interested in. So these will, from a security perspective, these will often be things uh, that are going to be similar to tainted sources. And you'll figure out where they're assigned. And you say, I want to reason about what is going to happen for inputs for this particular variable. 
So step one, figure out what objects you're interested in the program. And then we're going to keep track of what happens to those in paths through the program as we look at it and interpret it symbolically. The goal at the end of symbolic execution is that we want to be able to say, if you give some input in this range of values, uh, then this will happen. And if I want to drive a program to some particular line of code, give me an input that would get me there. Do input generation, also called test case generation, which is a really hard program and particularly f difficult for humans deep in software. If you've got hundreds of if statements and conditionals and you're trying to reason, how would I figure out some uh, input that will get me to this piece of line of code? It's a difficult problem. And here, symbolic execution can help. And this is really driven by recent advances in constraint solvers. So SAT solving, SMT solving have gotten extremely impressive uh, in recent years, and this has driven an uh, increase in excitement about symbolic execution. So let's look at an example. So say I have this code. At the beginning, we'll say name, the variable name comes in from some input source. And let's say I'm interested in this variable. So all mark, it's a little difficult to read, apologize, uh, but there's comments on the side if you can see it. Let's, so let's say I'll mark name as symbolic. Now, this is unconstrained at the beginning. I have no idea what the value is that name holds. It comes in from some input source that I don't control. So we just say it's question mark. It's, uh, we have no idea what this is, right? Now, as we step through, so a symbolic interpreter will be stepping through this program uh, and interpreting it as if it were running. Pure symbolic execution isn't actually going to run the program. And it'll look at the conditionals. So let's say we've taken the then branch here. Now, we know something about name. If we're executing this line of code, we know for a fact that name has to be equal to admin. So we can mark what we'll call a path constraint here. So at this point in code, we know that the value of name is admin. And this seems very simple and trivial, and in some cases it is, but imagine collecting a lot of these, right? So imagine 20 of these chained in a row. It would be very interesting to know, well, what is the solution to those constraints? And we can keep going here. So. Uh, if we get to this point, we know that it's the conjunction of the constraints. Uh, the name has to be admin. We know that command must be die. So if both of those are true, we get here. We can invert one of those. So if we get to this point, we say that name must be admin, command is not equal to die, so on and so forth. Invert the other one, name is not equal to admin. Now we have another one. So now we have two variables, name it must not be equal to admin. We have that path constraint, and we have another value that we'll call password, which we'll say is symbolic. We don't know what that is yet, right? It comes from input, and we play the same game. Here, name is not equal to admin. Length of password must be less than 20. Name is not equal to admin. Length of password is greater than or equal to 20. So we've gathered all of the constraints in this short snippet of code, so we know what has to happen here. Now you pass these to a constraint solver. So this is something that we're not going to cover. There is uh, off-the-shelf constraint solvers, uh, Z3 being a very popular one. There's many of them that are very fast. That Basically, it's a black box. You pass a whole big list of constraints to it, uh, and it will tell you these values solve it. It will give you one example back, usually. Some here's uh, the values that will get you here. It gives you solutions to the constraints and says, let's say I want to get to this line, crash. If you're a security person, crash is probably the most interesting line here. And you say, if I want to get to this point that will crash it, what do I need to pass? Now, clearly a human, could, again, could look at this and figure this out pretty quickly. But imagine this at scale. So you ask the constraint solver, tell me uh, values that would get me here. These are trivial. Name is admin. Command is equal to die. And it gives you these inputs back. You pass these to the program, and the program will crash. So that's the general idea. It gives you bugs. So what's the problem, or what are the good things about this? So input generation is amazing. Actually getting inputs back is amazing. You can get high coverage test suites. You get whole symbolic ranges. The problems, uh, this is really slow a lot of times. There are a lot of paths through the program. Paths uh, are exponential in the number of branches that you have. Uh, there are various advances that you can read about. Uh, nowadays, most people will use what's called concolic testing. So this is a combination of symbolic execution and running the program concretely uh, to bypass some problems, like what do you do if you have libraries. Uh, so that's generally what you'd want to look at uh, if you're interested in this now. And here are some examples uh, that could get you started in modern symbolic execution engines.
All right, so let's talk about fuzzing. Uh, while symbolic execution uh, is sort of intellectually very nice, it's like, oh, let's reason about values. Um, so fuzzing essentially is you're just throwing a ton of input at something and seeing what crashes. Um, so there's three main approach, uh, approaches that we're going to talk about, and each have strengths and weaknesses. Uh, so the first is a mutation-based approach. So we're starting with some known good inputs uh, that we've seen uh, supplied to the program. This is our input corpus. And then we're going to choose uh, a way to mutate this input into something that ideally is going to get uh, a crash or other interesting behavior from the target program. So this mutation could be flipping bits, uh, injecting random bytes um, that we think, uh, like, uh, null bytes or new lines or just things that we think will uh, cause problems. And then once we've mutated the known good input, we then give it to the application and observe what happens. So the nice thing about this approach is it's very easy to get started. You don't necessarily need to have any knowledge at all about the input structure uh, headed to uh, the program. But the challenge here is it can be tough to find non-surface level bugs. So let's say the uh, initial part of the program does some complicated vetting of the input before it gets to any of the interesting functionality. Unless your input uh, satisfies all those properties, you can't necessarily hit the deeper code that uh, you want to. OK, so the, another fuzzing approach is generation-based. So here, we're defining a specification for how input should be structured. So for example, for a uh, network packet, we could say, OK, uh, this many bytes is this header, and then we have a length field, and then we have a checksum, and different things like that. Uh, and then we are going to define a list of bad values for each data type uh, in this input specification. We're then going to generate all possible inputs uh, for the structure using uh, bad values, and then again send them to the program. So what's nice here is because we are codifying a specification for how the input should be structured, uh, we can, uh, in theory, get very deep coverage here uh, because we're providing input that uh, will be accepted uh, by the program. Uh, this can also handle complex input types with dependencies, so we could have a, a very complex data structure, each of which uh, or has a series of nested components, which we also specify how they should look. Um, so we can get great coverage this way. Uh, but the negative here is that it can require deep understanding of the input or protocol. So with the mutation-based approach, we could just sort of throw something at it and then hopefully get some value. Here we need to do upfront work uh, to figure out how exactly... Um, uh, to specify the input uh, to the program. And here's an example from BooFuzz uh, where we're saying um, if we're fuzzing FTP, we have the string user and then a space and then some username uh, and so forth. So again, mutation is we're just randomly mutating uh, the input and seeing what happens. Here we're saying this is what the, the structure of the input should look like at a high level and then tweak it based on the specification we've defined. OK, so the final approach is uh, evolution-based. Uh, so this is sort of taking the original mutation approach and taking it one step further. So again, we have a known good input corpus, uh, which we're going to mutate in some way. But this time, we're going to monitor execution uh, of the program for some property. Generally, we're looking at code coverage, uh, because the more of the program we're executing, the more likely we are to get to part of the program where there may be bugs. Um, so rather than targeting just one uh, narrow part of the code, we're going to prioritize uh, inputs that we mutate and get us somewhere else, because uh, uh, that's exciting. So as we mutate, when we find input that gets us to better code coverage, uh, let's add that back into the input and then keep mutating it to see if we can uh, spread more and more. Uh, so this can actually be incredibly effective at finding bugs. One of the most popular versions of this right now is called uh, American Fuzzy Lop, or AFL, which has found uh, a ton of bugs in uh, many, many different applications. Uh, and this can actually even find very hard to reach code paths. Um, one downside of this is to get maximum value. Oftentimes, you need the source code uh, so that you can instrument it. And you also are going to have to do a little bit of upfront work in terms of building test harnesses, which say, um, OK, so we have this complicated program. There are several functional regions, uh, each of which do different sort of things. You might want to build a test harness such that you're calling into each functional part so that you can make sure that the fuzzer can get to each part. OK, so what are some strengths of fuzzing? Um, depending on what type you're doing, it can be very fast to get set up. Um, so this is nice. Uh, even though conceptually fuzzing seems very simple, uh, it is incredibly effective at finding bugs uh, in many cases. It's also nice because you can just let it run continuously and then triage the crashes as they come. So you can be uh, doing manual penetration testing or doing other stuff and just sort of let this run in the background. Uh, 
And it's also very nice on C and C++ code bases, so looking for memory corruptions uh, and types of issues like that. Okay, so what's hard for fuzzing? Uh, again, code coverage, uh, as with many dynamic analysis approaches, uh, it's fundamentally hard. So when you're fuzzing, you can very quickly uh, get to some place in the program and sort of uh, navigate around in that space, but you may get stuck in this space and you're not uh, hitting a branch that's enabling you to test another big part of the code. So uh, if your initial input has some sort of complicated structure, maybe there's checksums or length field and uh, those are checked immediately and if you don't pass them then you never get anywhere. Uh, this can be tough uh, unless you're you know, specifying a specification for the input ahead of time. And again, deep nested conditionals or very complex program state may make it difficult for you to reach uh, program points uh, to fuzz. Uh, very, uh, stateful protocols or fuzzing network services can be challenging. And uh, again, complicated input formats or protocols, you might need to codify some knowledge up front. And a fundamental open question is how much fuzzing is good enough, right? You could just keep fuzzing until the sun burns out, but this may not be a, a good use of your time, right? So uh, generally what people do is uh, fuzz for a while until you're not getting any new branches covered that you haven't seen already. Um, but determining this in general is an open problem. Uh, so here's a couple of links to fuzzers of different types. So uh, some mutation ones, some generation ones. And uh, if you want to play around with this, I would encourage you to look at AFL or libfuzzer. Uh, those are very popular ones right now. And there's a couple of other miscellaneous ones um, uh, related to fuzzing Ethereum or uh, like the DOM for uh, testing browsers and even some fuzzing some .NET tool chains. Um, again, there's uh, hundreds or thousands of blog posts and good talks on these. Uh, here's just a few we recommend. So we mentioned that fuzzing has a problem with deep nested conditionals and reaching hard, uh, hard to reach paths in a program. Well, we just talked about something that is good at handling deep nested conditionals. And so really what the state of the art here is if you take fuzzing and you combine it with symbolic execution. The observation is that the code paths that fuzzing covers and the code paths that symbolic execution covers are complementary. Right? So fuzzing tends to be extremely fast at covering uh, bugs that it can reach. Right? So it will explore some compartments of the code very rapidly. But if you have some if statement that is complex, random mutation can be difficult to cross that. But we have something, symbolic execution and constraint solvers, that are very good at crossing complex constraints. They're slow in small areas, so they're not as fast as fuzzing as covering code. But if you get a fuzzer that is stuck, what you can do is then use a symbolic execution engine to cross that boundary and then keep fuzzing. So this is what people do uh, nowadays. Um, so if you uh, look at uh, the Cyber Grand Challenge, for example. So DARPA ran uh, a challenge to try to build automated tools to compete in binary analysis or DEF CON style CTFs. And pretty much everybody who did well in that challenge and ranked highly used some kind of combination of symbolic execution and fuzzing. So this, this is what for automated bug finding is sort of state of the art. Uh, here are some resources if you want to look at that in more detail. Uh, in particular, I would highly recommend looking at Driller, uh, augmenting fuzzing through selective symbolic execution. Uh, but uh, there, it has become very popular and is now sort of the de facto technique for if you want to find bugs, particularly in binaries. Uh, yeah, so just quickly some other related work. Uh, we've been talking about sort of the core fundamental principles of a number of analysis techniques. Uh, there's been some other work in uh, looking at uh, how are companies actually using this in practice? How do you integrate it into the SDLC? Uh, so the first one is a uh, shameless plug for something I did earlier, uh, where I basically talked with a number of different companies who are uh, trying to scale their internal security efforts using automation. And uh, I talk about a number of different ways uh, that they found that is helpful, some that aren't, and just generally what's uh, a good use of their time. And then Zane Lackey also has a very excellent talk in this space as well. So what do we get out of it? What's the end? So what, are, what do we take away from all this? Um, so the first thing to note is that 
Uh, none of this talks about finding business logic flaws. If you have something more subtle, uh, where you have some specification about how your application is supposed to operate the business logic level, these things won't by default be able to find that, right? Uh, and so you would have to be able to teach it what you're looking for. Second uh, thing to note is that a lot of this stuff has required a huge amount of effort to build. And while it can be fun and an interesting hobby project to try and roll one of these from scratch, in practice, you really, really don't want to do that. Uh, so find a tool, uh, customize an existing tool, but you probably don't want to go all the way from I am parsing source code to an AST to writing a symbolic execution engine. It's just going to take too long. Uh, and th there's no silver bullet here. Like None of these things will find everything. It's really important to understand what the strengths and weaknesses are of every technique because some techniques will just completely fail at finding a some class of bugs, and so it's important to uh, choose appropriately. So static taint analysis um, is really good for large code bases. I mean, one of the advantages is, is that it can cover uh, large amounts of code relatively quickly. And, but you have to be willing to invest time in tuning and triaging your tools. If you just run any static analysis tool, which most of you probably know this, it will fire up this tons of false positives. And you have to deal with this. And so you have to be willing to invest the time up front to tune it, to add the sanitizers uh, before you really start to get value out of that. It's not going to be uh, as good for dynamic languages, probably. There's a lot of research in this area, but generally tools are not very good at handling uh, languages with dynamic features. It's not going to be very good with microservices, usually. If you have lots of uh, data that's crossing APIs, uh, it's going to have a trouble tracking all of that. And finally, because of the false positive rates, uh, generally AppSec teams tend to hate them, and you're going to have problems uh, if you have a very small team and don't have uh, the amount of time it takes to tune these and go through the results. Dynamic taint analysis is great if you control the binaries and the uh, platform that it's running on, if you can build it and you can run it, uh, and if you're interested in information leakage or uh, that sort of taint analysis style problems. It's not going to be very good uh, if your input is just sort of, the application is structured in a way that input is going to go through bottlenecks uh, and start tainting everything. It, it, so you have to look at how your application is, is handling data. Symbolic execution is great if you actually need an input uh, to generate uh, and to, to reproduce the bug. It's great for solving complex and getting to deep places in the program, uh, but uh, it can't handle and scale to something that's, that's a very large code base. Fuzzing is great, if, particularly if you have uh, languages where you're looking for memory corruption and... Uh, very popular target is parsing code. If you have a parser somewhere in your code, you probably want to fuzz it. Please fuzz it. Uh, and it's also really nice if you happen to have a cluster of computers sitting around, your life will be much easier. But if you have complex stateful protocols, very complex inputs, uh, or complex logic, and then it's going to be time consuming to set up the harmonies that are required to fuzz your program. All right. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, if you find these types of things interesting, we're going to be writing uh, a number of blog posts uh, and other things uh, on our website uh, or uh, post to our Twitter. Um, uh, we're going to look at, ideally, a number of different open source tools and see when do they do well, uh, what uh, causes them to struggle, um, like a bunch of different static analysis tools per language, and a number of different things like that. Um, but yeah, we have a few minutes for any questions. Yeah. Yes, we will make these slides available. Uh, yeah, because we wanted to link to a bunch of things, which you can go to after. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Um, you did mention microservices. Do you have any suggestions for um, automating, like, uh, crossing that boundary between microservices without, I guess, knowing tailored specific information about how the APIs interact? Okay, the question is, do we have any uh, thoughts or recommendations for targeting microservices without necessarily uh, writing customizations to uh, describe how they work across API boundaries? Um, I think the answer to that in general, I don't think there's any approach that handles that particularly well. Um, so in theory, if you had the code for all of the different micro architecture, or all of the microservices, you could try to infer the different routes and then uh, connect them that way, but 
I, I think this is honestly a, an open research question that I don't think anyone tackles super well. Um, yeah, do you have any? Yeah, it's that without customization and really understanding part that you tacked on the, at the end that I think makes it tough. Uh, so if, if you control all the microservices and you could, you could just treat this as an aggregate analysis problem. And uh, so there's not too much difference in a microservice architecture from calling between modules or something uh, and, and uh, an RPC call or some sort of API call. So in theory, it uh, shouldn't be much different. In, in practice, it can be tricky. And so there's... No, we don't have excellent solutions for you. Yeah, I, I thought maybe you could just apply the methodologies to each individual node, but then you lose all the information about if one of the other nodes does synchronization, for example, or like where the actual source is coming from in particular. Like and it might depend on what you're looking for. Uh, so you might be able to do some sort of uh, dynamic taint technique where you have to then instrument and modify how the API is used, uh, and just then propagate across uh, microservices. But it's certainly, uh, it gets trickier. Microservices are definitely a more difficult problem. Yeah, uh, any final questions? Uh, okay, cool, feel, to, uh, feel free to come up after and chat. Uh, we'd love to talk about this. And thanks again for your time.